Interview number one of the New Westminster Veterans Oral History Project, Fall 2001. This is the interview of William Bill Strachan, October 17, 2001. So, first of all, please tell me your full name. William Thompson Strachan. And where were you born? St. Fergus, Aberdeenshire, 6.15 a.m., 8th of March, 1921. Okay, and what is your wife's full name and maiden name? My, my late wife or my or Jean? Oh, okay, both then. Well, my late wife was my girlfriend, but she married Margaret Ann Wallace. And and this and uh, and Jean, my, my late and Jean, uh, it's Eleanor Jean Holland, her maiden name. And do you have any children? We have six children. We had six children. One died with cancer. One died. So where are your parents from? Yeah, my parents is, is in Scotland. And tell me how you came from Scotland to New Westminster. Well, uh, my late wife wasn't happy with her family and we married, but she was my girlfriend in school days. And uh, we decided to come to Canada. And that's where we on it in New Westminster. And been happy ever since. So what's your current address? 660 133B Street. And so from what I remember from our preliminary interview, you lived in Saskatchewan? Saskatchewan and Alberta and came to BC in, 40, in 50, end of 50, December 50. Okay, good. So what branch of the armed forces were you involved in? The, the Golden Highlanders. And what was your rank? Private. And, uh, and did you stay private when you yes. finished? Yes, yes, definitely. Okay. <clears throat> okay, we're going to go to the pre-war section now. So when did you enroll in the armed forces? In 1935 in the territorial, territorials. And, uh, and then I was, I was a third horseman on a farm. I was born on a farm. I was a third horseman on a farm. And one man says to me, he says, well, he says, hey, we're, we're related. We're related. I said, to hell with this, and I go and join the motor force. So what did your family think of that? Well, my mother was quite mad, but anyhow. But yeah, that's the way it went, eh? <laughs> when you enrolled, did you enroll with other people, or just on your own? No, I, I met a relative in, in Strickland, which is in Aberdeenshire, Scotland, and he say, I said, to him, I want to join the garden. And he says, you know, you're a boy. He says, and uh, you have to be 18. But he says, if you go as a boy, you do the whole thing, but you don't get into the weight canteen, and not the same pay. So I says, okay, I says, I'll be 18. <laughs> and then, then the, the, the Scots Greys, because I get, they wanted me to enlist with them, because I was a horseman. Right. I said, oh no, 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 no. Yeah, the infantry. <clears throat> okay, when were you discharged of duty? Uh, 1945. In the middle of the year, I the hell that time will come home. Uh, October 31, I reached home. October 31st. My right. mother didn't know me. No, eh? A totally different person. He didn't recognize me at all. So how did you feel when you discovered that war was declared by Germany? Declared by Germany? Well, we thought it wouldn't last long, you know. But we learned that it did last long, and a lot of people was quite disappointed in the war. Was they? Yeah. And so when you decided to join, what was your reason for joining? My reason for joining because I got fed up with our relatives. <laughs> <laughs> Working. Because you joined before the war, didn't you? Oh, yes, I joined before the war. Yeah. So where did you get your training? In Aldershot, England. And for how long was that? Uh, about uh, six months or a year, or somewhere around there. Mm -hmm. And that was infantry? Infantry, training. yes. Okay, why don't you tell me a bit about what training camp was like? Well, training camp was good, because I was already in a chart of trials, I knew most of it. So I had no problem. No problem. So what, take me on an average day? Yeah, just, you know, average day. And they, if we, we were Helen Bush. Right. Okay. And if you, and you was leaving the barracks to go downtown, you had to stay over another, and you'd wear them pants, back you go, take them off. Because a hound that didn't wear pants, pants had a kill. And that was, I don't know whether I was supposed to be there or no, but that's the truth. 
And so, for the rest of the day, what would you do? Oh, in the evenings. That's what you mean, in the evenings? Or all day? All, all the training we were training, and the, I learned to drive, and, and the England was the, and the, oh, I forget the name of the place, but anyhow, I learned to drive there, and I had no problem. And then I was a number one, number one machine gunner. Oh, you were? Yes. Number one machine gunner. Yes. I could, take, I could take the gun, light pole with the flat and put it together again. So when you went to across the Pacific and yeah. the Atlantic, is that how you made it? We went in across the in, a, in, a, in a boat. We went 28 days. We left a, 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 what we left a, a Southampton. Okay. It took 28 days from out to Singapore. Okay, really? Yeah. And uh, we stopped in Port Said and some other places. So what was it like? Well, we, we enjoyed the trip in Singapore, uh, in the trip in the boat. Yeah. And when you arrived in Singapore? Yeah, was we, like? we was in the harbor and didn't know it. There's a big harbor. And we was arriving. We didn't know it was in the harbor until we docked with it. Uh, maybe half a mile long. Oh. So you were stationed in the city of Singapore? No, in uh, Southern Barak, Changi. About 30 miles from Singapore. Okay. And so what was it like there? It was good, beautiful. Really a nice country. And we had lots of friends. We made friends with the Chinese people and everything. Well, I did anyway. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And they were all, you know, generous and... Yes, yes. yes. And they, they, we, we worked, we, we did duties from, from 8 to 12. And after 12, we were free. So, um, tell me a bit about the vegetation, what it was like there, what your feelings were. Oh, like the, uh, I was a Italian monkey. I could climb coconut trees and take down the coconuts. And the vegetation it was nice. There was banana plantations and all that, and, and pomegranates and the custard apples, all that stuff. Right. So, was it the summer that you arrived there, or the April, I think? April. So, just at the beginning of the yeah. rainy season. Yeah. Right? <clears throat> so during the war, were you involved in any sort of campaigns? We was a uh, we went up we were the uh, troops. It was we went up to up part of Malay. We only fought for uh, two months, then uh, because we were supposed to be garrison troops. So we was in until we went up. We fought all the way down, but even at the Singapore, it was still lost. Still lost. Yeah. And is that when you became a POW? The 15th of February, 1942. Okay, so this will be a hard part now. It'd probably be good if you could describe a little bit about your experience as a POW. Well, as a POW, we, we went back to Changi, and until we were on barracks, and all our stuff was in a big heap. It was in a big heap. And, and they, so we went through, and I got five pictures. I got one of the castle. One of my sisters, one of my girlfriends, which was Kim, my wife, and a, a, I've forgotten now, my sisters, my wife, Castle, I forgot, on myself, of course, and a friend. Right. And a friend. And a uh, friend was from Aberdeen. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that was? He was killed. He was killed. He was with you then? He was just up country, yeah. fighting, but he got killed and I got his picture. And I sent it back to his, to his uh, parents. And so they took your pictures too, or? Yeah, I took everything. Everything was piled up, you know, and ready to be, ready to be bombed. So. So how did it, how did it come about? Did they attack you, or they surrounded you? They, they, they surrounded us. They, we went up country there to, to fight, and they used, and the, and the, and the Jap says, come on, you Scotch bastards. So that was it. They knew we were bloody Scottish. So how did they know? I don't know. <laughs> were you wearing your kilt? No, no, <laughs> not playing. We were wearing khaki uniform. Yeah, yeah. So, so how long were you uh, POW? Three and a half years. And what sort of experiences did you have? Well, it was terrible. Terrible. You had to had to slave, and I remember seeing one man Australian. In Japanese, in a Jap ordered them to do something they didn't understand. He took up a pick on and broke his arm. Right, punishment was handed out for these little things. 
punishment was if you stand in the sun with a rock above your head and then if you fell or you know, because you were passed up, you got a beating or tied to a tree or something like that and stand in the sun for hours or maybe all day until you fell. So did you guys stand together? Yes, shoulder to shoulder. Oh, by the way, that's after we are coming off the bridge, one of the approaches, he used to give us a job, and, it, and they said, when you finish, go home. So the, every job got bigger and bigger and bigger. So I said to the boys, I said, to hell with this, let's sit down. And that's what we did. We had a strike and got away with it. So we were very fortunate. They didn't do anything? No, they kept us there, and the, the, and the, the people, the Japs was looking after us there, were scared to go back to the camp because we had done no work. So they, so they come, come, they come out, sight over his name, came out and took us home, and took us back to camp, or what we call camp, and then brought another unit in floodlights, and they had to do the work. Wow. And so this went on for three and a half years. Yeah, oh, punishment, yes. Uh, on, and on the bridge, you've got, on the, on the power drive and the wooden trestles, we were supposed to sing a song, Tojo. No, okay, no, no, sayo, no, sayo, which means lift it up higher and higher. So we sung, told you a bastard, he like no cock on milk, milk and coconut oil. <laughs> ah, and that's the little, that's the little jack come up to us and says, shut up. He says, some of them slumped eyed bastards will know what you're saying. He was a, a American from Texas. He had a Texas draw. He went to Japan as a holiday and he was caught and pressed into the forces as, a, as an interpreter. Oh, okay. So he, he warned us what we said because a lot of them understood English. Mm. So at camp, at night, when you're a POW, what sort of things did you and the men talk about? Oh, we talked about uh, what was going on and we didn't understand nothing, we didn't know nothing, you know. We wondered and uh, what was going on. And one man found a radio and he, he got a coffee can from one of the ties and he took all the coffee out, put the radio in the bottom, filled up the coffee again. So at night he could switch us on and listen to the news. So we, we kept that for a while and then the Jacks discovered it, so we were all punished for that. Right. Yeah. Huh. <laughs> so what what projects did you complete or okay. work on you during slaved on the bridge, railroad of death? And uh, which is 250 miles long from, from Tamakan to Momi, and uh, around uh, 160,000 died as prisoners. And uh, all, all, all POWs? POWs and some civilians, yes. Right. And, uh, and then I was working on the, on the cotton, you know, on a cotton on the railroad, and one man broke his, a uh, Welding tongs. Yeah. So that was a dilemma. Now we have to do something because of the beaten. Nobody knew how to weld. And stupid me said, I'll have a go. So I got the hold of the tongue and then a little fire. And I bumped it and bumped it. But finally I got it to stick to it here. And it was two inches short. I said, oh, what the fuck can I do now? So I cut off the handle, smoothed everything out. And he handed it in at night, and there was not a word said. But he didn't know it was broken. <laughs> but saved us from a beaten, maybe right. death. When you were building the railroad and the bridge, and all the other things, did you sort of try to do a bad job? Oh, yes. That was our job. Well, prisoners, but we still soldiers at heart. We tried to destroy, not destroy things, but to hinder them. Every chance we got. And on the and on the project of the bridge was built up with earth. We threw in all rotten tree trunks and stuff, you know, covered up all nicely and planted grass on the little spots all over the side of the oh yeah. And put white ants or kermits as you call them here, onto the pallets, underneath the pallet. We search for the queen and then put the and then the pallet. Really? Oh yes. <laughs> so, um tell me just a bit about a little bit more, if you can, about the social life of being in that camp. The social life really wasn't much of a social life because we worked most times a long time, sometimes 18 hours, you know. 
on the, maybe six ounces of rice. You know. But then we would uh, sometimes we would work in a work and, work and cruise, and we would uh, Thai girl or a Thai person or a Chinese or a Malayan a Burmese would know their head. So at night the Japanese wouldn't go into the jungle at night because it was 90 percent of the railroad was on jungle, and. Uh, so we would know to go there, there'd be some kind of food for us, peanuts, gula malacca, or whatever. We'd, pull to, we'd take it back into the camp and share it. Share it. And if it was fish, we would stick it in our jack puppies with this wine cloth, this overhead, bare feet, and wine cloths. Really? Yeah. No head gear. So we'd stick it in the wine cloth, you know, bring it into the camp, walking straight, sometimes in daytime. Jack wouldn't, wouldn't take notice of the wine cloth. Really? Yeah. Wow. And um, what kind of friendships did you develop? Well, we had, we had close friendships. Yeah. We really had close friendships. Everybody had close friendships. And do you still are you still in touch with any of them? Not now. Most of my friends are gone. Yeah. I'm the only one right now. From that? Yeah. Okay. Only one here. Right. And one in Scotland. They all, they all died in Scotland. There's one left, one in Scotland yet, which was which when I made the tea. <laughs> Tell me about the tea. Uh, we had the, I, I forget, five, five, uh, 45 gallon drums, gas uh, drums, petrol drums. I was ordered by the Japanese to be Gonga Dino, water boy, whatever. And uh, so, and I was filling them up at the river Mekong, which is a bridge is over, Mekong, not the river Kwai. And they, uh, and they, uh, so a Thai girl walked by and, and she just slowly and kept walking and says, take, take the, the limes from the tree, which was a small tree then, take the limes because if you don't take them, the jacks will steal them. So I took the limes and I cut them up, I broke them up, I forget what I did, I did something and I got them all cut up, broke up, put them into the water, boiled the water because we had to boil all water. And the boys was enjoying us all day long working and and rice bag bully, which he was the only guy with a blanket made of a rice bag of some tie had given him. Comes up and he shakes the drums. Oh, that's a good looking one. He gets his mug in. He says, and, and starts to split and splutter. You've poisoned me, Wally. I said, no, I haven't. I said, that's tobacco juice. You didn't give me time to tell you that the tobacco ball, tobacco, this man wanted boiled and dried to spread out. And that's what it was. He's still alive. <laughs> and he's doing well in Scotland. Hey? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So just going back to before you were captured. Yeah. Um, tell me just what it was like on your average day as a soldier in Singapore. Well, we, we had lots of the things that we did. We used to go for swims and the stuff like that, and well, it, it, it picture shows. And the uh, picture shows and go into the bazaars. There's lots of things we did. Swim. We used to double dive. You know, double dive. You never see it now. One man would go up to the end of the diving ball, stand in his hands. You would come up, take his ankles. He would take your ankles and would fall into the water. That was a part of a recreation. And the recreation we used to play truth and dare. And uh, you go in there and then you start doing something, you know, and they would come up and you try to say to you know, about so and so and so and so. And you tell a lie, your punishment was to go out there and kiss the first girl that was in the swimming pool. It may have been a Malay and Chinese or whatever. They're all in the fun of it. It was lots of fun. <laughs> <laughs> and so you're saying you, you would be off at 12 o'clock? 12 right? o'clock. So Except yeah. if you was in Darjeeling. Right. So at 12 o'clock, I and mean, then you have the rest of the day off. Rest the day off. Very nice. Yeah. Until you were fighting. Yeah. And what was it like when you were fighting? When we were fighting, we didn't do much fighting. We just come down. We were always pushed down. You know, pushed down. And one man bent down to go through the wire, and uh, he got killed by a bullet right in the back of his head. But uh, that was only two. It was a uh, uh, Glenn and that's a man who got killed during the fighting. Right. Some wounded, a little wounded. But Right, right, right. And the people, the, the local people, what were they like? You didn't trust East Indians. No. no. East Indians, one time we were all in there, and they used to come right through the middle of us. 
and the our our uh, officer in charge said, let them go, don't we want the way up and disappear and then we got shell. So he was scouting them. He was scouting. Yeah. <laughs> they had balloons up in the air. Hmm. What about the rest of the people? The rest of it was good. The Malayans was good and and the Chinese were all good. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then your commanding officers? What, tell me a bit about your commanding officers. Some of them were pretty good and some of them weren't. <laughs> as simple as that, hey? Yeah. <laughs> some of them didn't know they were coming or going. Right. Okay, I think we got much of it covered then. So, um, Tell me about maybe one memory or experience that really stands out. Why don't you give me a good memory and a bad memory that stands out during your time um, of the war? Well, <clears throat> one day I was duty truck and I was driving along the road. One day, all at once, a big gun went off, which is a bomb shot of a ton of shell. And I was lifted off the road and through the jungle. That was, and that man visited us here, and he was uh, an Englishman. He was a man that fired the gun. Visited us here. Okay. After going around the world, and here we are meeting again. I told him, I story, he says, I was a man that fired the gun. <laughs> <laughs> that's the one of the memories I have. Right, right. And uh, uh, that's the, but that was a uh, good memory, I reckon. <laughs> <laughs> and the uh, bad memory was, was seeing some of my buddies. Being killed. You know, there was one man, it was uh, in the last day we were fighting there. Uh, one man went down to, oh, no, the, the good memory was, I remember now, was uh, I was put in charge of the beer. The one at the camp. We were at the camp with the people left the beer. Okay. This was in Singapore itself. So a, a man by the name of Finney, Gordon Hounder, only one bottle we allowed a day, come to me, he says, Bill, Give me a bottle of beer. And I says, you already have your bottle of beer. Okay, but he says, I need another one. So I gave him another beer and he said, uh, and his trench was, his, 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 his trench was blown up. And all the way was one bullet. And I have it now, my son has it now, and we have it today. So he sat down, took a break, and when he took a break, his trench was blown up. Yeah, he took that beer. So I didn't drink at that time. I didn't ask why I was put on to us. I, I never was a drinker. So that would be a good man. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Hmm. And he was private funny. I don't know if he's still alive. You want to give us a, a, a bad memory? A bad memory? Or an experience that really stands out? Another experience that stands out was a, was a man that he used to ride only time if I was driving in the trucks. He would just ride with me in the truck. And they, I came into the, run to his quarters there and they, it was in, being attended by the hospital staff, or it wasn't the hospital staff, the field staff, and the, the shirt storm. And I went to take it off. And he says, no, don't take it off. And they need that guy at home. You know. It's the shirt on his back, the hole in his back. Okay. Mm. So they fixed him and they, he survived. And another thing about the law, was a, uh, I was shelling us. So what the, what am I going to do? And there was a big clump of bamboo and it was a six foot drain by six foot deep by two in the bottom of a monsoon drain. I said, well, I said, that's a good place to go. The son told me, don't go to the clump of bamboo. And that's what I did. And after the shelling stopped, I went over to that drain, which I just full of shot. Now that's a good memory. I'd have been killed. <laughs> Most definitely, yeah. most definitely. But I don't know what told me, but just sex, sex sense, I reckon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of course, I would burn them head for a piece of shrapnel, no? but that's okay. Yeah, so that was that your only real injury? That was my only real injury. Getting burned. So you survived a lot then? Oh, yeah. Very things I tell people, very few things I really tell people. Yeah. It was just all locked up inside? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, are you, are you satisfied with that then? Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, well, we'll go on to post-war things then. And um, just just tell me what it was like when you found out that the war was over. When the war was over, oh, I remember. We were building, making us a, a place for the planes to land. 
and a uh, runway for the planes in the middle of the jungle called the Rotten Tactic Boat Tide. We swayed there and we didn't have the road, the roller was no steam. It was built for steam. The old man had to pull it from drops and pull it back. There was men ahead of the roller, men in the back, and so you went up fast and forth and fast and forth. Anyhow, it was all there. Oh, and we got the told, no more work, no more, no work, as they called it. We called it slaving. And they, we tried to be about a week or two weeks, I don't remember exactly. But anyhow, we was put back to work again, slave. And then we were slaving away there, and they, that's a big four inch bomber come overhead. We said, oh God, we've got one of our bombers now. And they, then this woman, which was a lady, 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 Montgomery, Louis Montgomery, and they, she pulled up a sketch, you know, showing her, her, her above her knee, you know, she just stood in the door. And we said to one, what the hell good is that to us if we couldn't bugger all the boys if she came down anyhow? But they didn't land through it in the beginning. But the flame commander, uh, uh, Dakota, we went, and out come this man in the jungle. We looked, you know, we was in the jungle, we looked. And they, so once we realized that we was free, we took up drums and sticks and made a hell of a racket. And uh, out come this man, up comes one man to this fella, and says, don't you remember me? And the man says, no, I do not remember you. I never saw you. He says, oh, yes, you did. He says, you sold me a pair of Japanese shitty pants. So cause we used to steal from the job. Shitty pants. And he says, I didn't sell you shitty pants. I sold that to a, to a Buddhist priest. Well, he says, I was him. He was a, he was a secret service man. And then there was another time. Was in the, was in the Bantong. And the, this here, the camp. And we had a, a garden there. And the, he told us one day, he says, when I'm gone, he says, you guys leave camp. You guys leave camp. And we says, to us one another, what the hell are talking about, you know? He says, I'll go and visit my wife. He's in the compound. He used to come in and get a Japanese slop, leftover food. That's non product, not bantong, non product. And the uh, planes come over top next day and they uh, aim it for the railroad station. But they got our camp with 300 of our guys killed or wounded in the camp. So, in uh, the uh, next day, and come this here, uh, that was American planes way up high. And then, and come this set of later planes, and there were British, and I think there was a British Canadian with them, I think, because they had a, a, a different, around the length of a maple leaf, come down and bombed and got the railroad station and didn't have touch us at all. So that was us. And then, do you want to want it? Okay, then I'll tell you about the Hashimoto had this out digging square. I forget, maybe about a quarter of a mile square, six foot by six. And uh, that, he said it was for his gas drums. But the really it was for us and we were going to be all killed at freedom and before the war ended. That was all, they were going to shoot us all off and bury us in up there because we died. So, how come you weren't shot? Because they called us away again to up country. And they, but by the time we was up country, we was in the, was in La Beauty, Thailand, and they, and people was going by there and they told us that they were heading out for the, their last walk. Because we could be shot. Okay. But that didn't happen. The war had finished. The war had finished. Yeah. So, what happened to your captors, the Japanese? Oh, they disappeared. Uh, when we was released, uh, can we so released before we come back in after that. So the Japanese just disappeared? Disappeared. They just disappeared. And they, uh, and they, then that's when, that's when they brought in, that's the they caught, they brought in letters for us to write. And so we start writing a what, what do you spell that word, huh? So you go look at the other one's letter, see you can find the word you wanted. That, we couldn't think anymore. Really? Yeah, we couldn't write. And they so we go around looking at everybody's letters <laughs> to find the word we're looking for and everything, and they got their mail there. And what sort of things did you write? About the part of our life as prisoners and the children was coming home. Right. So that plane at Dakota had landed. I was one of the first 12 to leave camp. So we landed in, the, in the Rangoon, 
the close up the railroad track and gave us a map and that's for it. And uh, ran it in Rangoon and was put into this place in Rangoon and a woman sat in each table. And she sat there, we didn't speak. We just get. And anyhow, one of us, one man, or one woman, and volunteer her time to get the prisoners coming back. And one man sitting with us, got up, jumped over the camp, grabbed this one. We thought he was Fonacci. It was his wife. Wow. She didn't recognize him, but he recognized her. We forget you've been crazy, Fonacci. And then we left that place, and we flown in, and we went into the hospital. We never saw him again, but we, we went into the hospital. And the two nurses, so I was walking by, here comes a walking skeleton. That's what you guys, you, so you used 67 pounds. That's what you were. Skin and bone. But baby, is that a phone in my lips? <laughs> it's hard to believe, isn't it? It is hard to believe. Yes. 67 pounds. I was tell everybody he's empty six because it, they wouldn't believe me anyhow. And uh, stuff like that. And so you went to the hospital and they checked you out? And yeah, you out. and they put us on rice and, uh, and ordinary food. Slowly put us on to full food, you know. And look at tablets. And if, and they, after about a week or two weeks, I don't remember, I can't remember, they, they sent us to down to the ship to get on board to go back to Blighty and uh, so we on board the ship and uh, everybody was friends again, everybody you know, didn't know them but we knew we were all prisoners and uh, we left the ship, go on board the ship and set sail and stopped the port sail on the way back and we was, uh, we was off and uh, and uh, well, we stopped the salon, not near our port sail and, and uh, on the way back and then the uh, a man told us, okay, fill your kit bags because you want to go through customs. Oh, in customs, which I forgot when I got in the triangle from the release, and I got the, uh, a hunk of the opium, about four inches long, about two inches wide, and an inch deep. Deep. Took it home with me. Your, your gift. <laughs> yeah. Which I didn't know what it was. Right. I threw it in the, I threw it in one of the drawers and my mother's home. Anyhow, and the, the, the skipper of the ship comes on and he says, I was just told that uh, I had to dis, uh, you guys had to disembark and we're going to take in nurses. But he says, no, I will not do that. He says, you are prisoners and my orders was to bring prisoners home. That's exactly what I'm going to do. And that's what we did. That's what he did. We went into Southampton Harbour and there's all the tenants along the bloody harbour and there was a big white one with a rotten egg in the middle of a Japanese flag, we call it rotten egg. And they wouldn't, the prisoners wouldn't, we wouldn't come off board. No, they couldn't figure out why we didn't come off. And the family told them, get that Jap flag out of there. Why did they have the flag out? Oh, they didn't realize it was a, just banners. You know, we didn't take it that way. It was just triangle banners. You know. Right. Welcome home banner. Oh, I see. See, and it was only a, it was only a white triangle with that, uh, yeah. red center. We took it to be a jet. So what was your feeling when you stepped foot on oh, the soil? Beautiful. And went into the hospital, yeah. Oh, they took you back to the hospital? Yeah. And then they had a file, and then they shipped us home, which I arrived in Scotland on the 31st of October 1945. What did people say to you? People just looked at me. Were you still skin and bones? Yeah, people just looked at me and they... Walked out in my house and my mother says, you're home early, and looked at me, she didn't know who the hell I was. You think it was her other son, because I'm my brother. Wow. Did, what, what sort of thing, how did the army take care of you when you Oh, good, back? good. We had a year, we had a year holiday with me. And they, they, they treated us well, they gave us food stamps, you know, and gas stamps. We didn't know what the hell they were for. But my mother said, well, that's what, you can get extra food. And, uh, and uh, they they looked at us quite well. They took us back into uh, to Edinburgh, and uh, there was and and the the woman and the other across the camp from us was supposed to bring us back to civilization. Right. 
it was forced to ease things into the way life was. And how did that go? It went pretty well, you know. It could have went better, but it went pretty well. Right. They come over to our camp at night and stuff, you know, and try to get us back into civilization. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So when you came back and you kind of got into civilization, um, what sort of things did you do for work after you were discharged? After I was discharged, I worked in that quarry for a while, prepared up to an art. Then I went back to my young life at the farms. Mm-hmm. And the, uh, and the, uh, as I say, and in 46, my late wife and I got married, and then in 49, we came to Canada. But I was a farm boy at heart, always. Mm-hmm. So in Canada, what did, what did you do? I came into a, a farm in, in the Iron Alberta, dairy farm. Then I said, oh, well, let's move again. So uh, a man from Waka come and visited me, and he says, come and, and, and work for him. I don't know if he knew about me, but anyhow, I, we went, and they, I was a cowboy for a while, <laughs> and, and they had fun with me. But I never got mad, because that had been worse. And they, and they was out around the cattle, you know, and I knew nothing about neck lining. They were going around there, like a bite out of hell, you know. My line struck a pony's neck and went one way, and I went right on the ground. <laughs> so I, I just got up and got on the horse. Again, but I was wise to that move after that. Yeah, and that. <laughs> and then they round up the cattle, inoculate them, dehorn them, and castrate them. Mm-hmm. And the cowboys were the last suit, you know. Oh, come on, Scotty, have a go. No, 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 no. <laughs> Anyhow, I finally gave in. Try, try, try. And I got one around the foot. A last suit around the foot of the cow. <laughs> and they, so there was a, a, there was a pole in the middle, so I got the pole around, okay. So there's all the other cowboys put on the, up on the fence. And so I got up near, you know, and the, 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 the rancher himself come around and put his finger in that and off those. And his neck had twisted one down. That's another thing I learned. And then the, the cowboy says to me, Scotty, you know the next time to take him around the neck. <laughs> Not the foot. <laughs> <laughs> so then you, you went from there to New West. Yes, I went to New West. And did you farm here too? No, no, no. I went to what the Swiss. Swiss. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Tell them what's lost. Well, they stopped there. Yeah. And, and you did that till you retired? Or? Retired, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, and my late wife died, and Jean and I used to be neighbors, and Margaret and I, and they, her husband, my late wife died, and they sent the what? And her late husband died, and sent the I like that. And then we got and then we got married in seventy six. We bumped in again accidentally. And you've been married ever since? You know, since he was born at Trump. Oh, okay. Okay, that's great. Um do you belong to any veterans organizations? No. I used to be in the Army Navy Club. I used to I was president there for a while but then I quit. You know, everything you go in there when I started to drink beer, I was not a drinker and they, Oh yeah, that's bottle, that's bottle, and all that stuff. Uh, Didn't want to be involved in no. that. No. And we belong to the Sons of Scotland and the Eagles. You still, you still belong to them. Still belong to Sons of Scotland and the Eagles. That's two uh, organizations. Right. And so do you just communicate through newsletters, things like that? No, we go meetings. We go yeah. to meetings and do stuff like that. Well, we, we've got lots of things going, you know, like ball, a uh, balls and stuff like that, you know. We have things, all kind of things go. What, what sort of things does, do these organizations provide you with? The, in, ter- in terms of support and things like that. Uh, friendship. Yeah. Friendship and, and the, everything like that. And the Eagles, the, and on the Eagles I have a very old friend. Uh, they bury me if I die, but actually they deviate with that. Right. So they take care of you even after you yeah. die that. Well, the DBA looks after me well here. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's good. They have a guy come do the garden, and, and they, they have a person, a girl who come and do the house. Right. Because it's beyond us. The DBA does that. Oh, that's great. The D- oh, yeah. They're, DBA. they're wonderful. I have no arguments with the DBA at all. The DBA. Yeah. What does that stand for? The Department of Veterans and Organizers. Oh, okay. See, I'm a little walker out there. Oh, yeah. Okay. 
Oh, well, that's great that they take care of you. Oh, they take care of us. They take care of my wife and I. Yeah, that's really good. Okay. Um, okay, just a couple more questions. Uh, the 50th anniversary of World War II, what was that like here? 50, 50. It was, you know, the, they had a huge celebration in 1995. Nobody didn't even go there. <laughs> I don't even remember them. Okay, well then, how about just ex your experiences or feelings? On Remembrance Day. Right. Oh, I all, we always call Remembrance Day. We 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 get a leaf, mm -hmm. my wife and I, and we got a leaf. We go to, to the summer staff in Westminster, mm -hmm. and the whole family joins in. You know, the 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 boys and the girls, you know, like our kids, they lay the leaf, and I go with them. And the region says that's cool to see families doing that. Mm -hmm. but we do every year, then for the last fifty odd years. That I've been doing it. Really? Hey? Yeah. And then afterwards, you guys go for lunch. We, we go and have lunch. Yeah. We go the whole bunch. I, we feel that they, the, the family, the, the children are putting in their time. Right. And they're going to carry on from we're gone. Mm -hmm. So why not take them lunch? <laughs> yeah. It's so important to create a tradition like that. Well, oh, sure, so yeah. sure it is. Why, why do you think it's so important? Memories of uh, their uncle. Yeah. They didn't come back. And he died in the prison of our camp. Well, he died of a horrible death. And they, and they, they, they feel that they owe us to them. They feel that they owe us to them. Right. Freedom. Right. You know. And which we are, we are proud of that. Yeah. To have your kids, so. Yes. Yeah. You feel honored? Yes. Yeah. We are very honored that they do that. Okay. I think that's about it. Is there anything else that you'd like to talk about? You know, any experiences or any feelings that you haven't really had a chance to express here? I'll, I'll show you something. Yes. A little poem that I wrote. Okay. Do I sit here? Okay. This is my wife. She made read the poem. Right along my life. Another bonus year. In the Bridge Builders POW Camp Tamar Camp in the year 1943, the camp doctor said to me, Strong, you will soon be free, but one can obviously see that I have surely fooled them. The tremor in my voice you hear, the moisture in my eyes you see, are feelings for my young comrade that were not as fortunate as I. For as of today, March 8th, and then my miraculous 58th bonus year. Thank you. This is another poem written by Mr. Strachan, read by his wife, Jean. Their Darkest Mile while slaving on the death railroad, placing te deep teak sleepers along the rail bed, ahead of the ribbons of steel layers, following them skeleton spike drivers, and in their weakened conditions could barely wield the weighty hammers, I, one grievous to behold, emaciated from lack of nourishing food and sadistically driven beyond their endurance by the armed pitiless jets. Casually and Covertly observing my fellow POWs as we neared Syok Falls, I observed the despair in a few comrades' eyes as they slaved sixty-five miles from Tamarkan, that their stay above Thailand's grin, sad to say, will navy sang. As they courageously hobble their darkest smile, far, far for their loved ones, which will never see their painful smile. Now their tortured and emaciated bodies, with excrement running down their wobble legs, bypassing their tropical, ulcerated, black, skinless tibias. Oh, yes, walking skeletons wearing only Japapis caused by incinerate and feral Japs. Our life as POWs were always precarious, as the Japs called all Scot Scotland, Scotlando was very lazy and often, for our sluggishness, got lambasted. But that was our patriotic duty, no matter the consequences, to impede our captors at every opportunity. For we, the Gordon Highlanders, were still soldiers at heart, and my abiding hatred for the Japanese will remain till my demise. William Thompson Strack.